Cool. So uh, thanks for coming out tonight. We want to try to make it worth your while. Um, again, my name is Mark Spencer. This is Steve Martin. So um, we do work for a, we have a company called Ripple Training, where we provide training and tutorials, plugins, uh, primarily for Final Pro 10 and related applications. We also do a weekly show called Mac Break Studios. Anybody here seen that show? <laughs> All right, great, excellent. Um, you're going to want to. You may have noticed we usually release on Tuesday mornings, and we didn't this week. Uh, and the reason is we have a very special series of shows, uh, and it took some extra work. So you want to, if you watch a show, or even if you don't, uh, it's kicking off tomorrow morning will be the first of a series of four shows covering uh, sort of the full Final Cut Pro editing system using the Mac Pro, using a 4K display, using the Promise uh, R8, Promise 2 R8, using that whole system, and going over why you might want it and why you might not want it, like why an iMac might be appropriate for you or why a MacBook Pro might be appropriate for you. So we'll talk about workflow, we'll talk about specific projects, whether it's 4K or not. So check that out, we're doing that, that should start out tomorrow. What's the oh, so um, so here's here's the best way to go. If you go to RippleTraining.com, there's a link. Steve's got it right here. First for our free videos. If you're upgrading to 10.1, is anybody considering upgrading to 10.1 and hasn't done it yet? Okay. Before you do anything, watch these three free videos. Steve's pointing to it where it says 10.1 free. Uh, what does it say? Free tutorials. There's three tutorials there on how to prepare, how to upgrade, and how to clean up after you upgrade it. So you, you want to watch those to um, make sure you understand what's going to happen. You can probably do fine without it, but that's just going to make you more comfortable because there is an upgrade process from 10.09 and earlier to 10.1. Um, so I th what we're going to do tonight is we're not going to repeat stuff that you can watch online because that would be a waste of your time. So we're going to show you some new features in Final Cut 10. We're going to focus on features, um, but we're also going to explain a little bit the library model, and we're going to try to leave a lot of time for Q&A so we can actually get into things that you're interested in learning about. So I think we should jump in with that. All right. And we'll, we'll try to push the Q&A to the end, we'll get, so that because um, I think if we start Q&A, we'll never ever get to the things we want to try to talk about. So we're going to try to push through about 40 minutes, and then we'll uh, leave time for Q&A at the end. All right. So thanks all for coming out. We'll just jump right in. The first thing that we want to talk about is the 10.1 or 10.1, uh, what we call the unified library model, uh, as opposed to the previous version where there was two separate libraries. There was like a project library, an events library, and it was just, when it came time to media management and organizing your projects and collaborating and archiving, it, it was just uh, it was just very convoluted, difficult, and a lot of times you'd get these red offline clips that was frustrating. So. 10.1, biggest change of all, is completely new library model. It's just so much cleaner, so much more versatile, so much more utilitarian. And I'm going to go ahead and uh, zoom up to the upper corner of the interface so we can see here. Uh, you have essentially libraries. And within libraries, you have uh, what are called events. And events are just like folders for containing your media. And inside events, you have the project, which is your actual work, your, your cut for cut work, your, you can think of your timeline, and then all your individual clips. Here, um, I have a library called Lifted. This is a short film that I produced uh, just recently. And I want to kind of talk about how you might think about organizing your media. Because it's, there's a lot of different ways. There's no like, set way of doing it. It just depends on your workflow. So for example, here, I have a library. Think of a library as like a master container, a master suitcase for a particular production. In fact, Mark and I like to refer to these as self-contained production units. So for example, this short film called Lifted, we created a library for, and uh, within that library, I created two separate events. Now events are the containers for your media and your projects, as I just mentioned. Here I created a separate event called Aerials, and this would be all of the um, content relative to the aerial cinematography. My friend uh, down in uh, Scottsdale, Arizona has an amazing aerial cinematography company. So I wanted, to, I wanted to create a separate event for all of the aerials. I also have a separate event for all of the stuff that we shot in the hangar, which would include uh, some interviews of the uh, proprietor and uh, some of the shots of him getting preparing his aircraft. So I, I essentially broke this particular project down into uh, two events, and within those events, uh, I then further broke them down to what are called keyword collections. Now, the thing about a keyword collection, and I mentioned to somebody at the break, 
Final Cut Pro 10 is all about metadata. In fact, think of Final Cut Pro 10 as really a giant database. It's managing everything under the hood, from what you name the clip to how you tag it, everything. And there are no bins in Final Cut 10. It's all what are called collections. And these are essentially keyword collections. And you just tag them on the way in, or you tag them on, if you're on, on, on certain cameras, you can tag them before bringing them in. In this case, I tag them after the fact. And these are all separate keyword collections of my media. And uh, th different ways you can organize. So, the events themselves can be broken down into separate collections. Here's another example. I, I really love doing time lapse. Here's a time lapse project that has the, uh, a library in it. So I broke it down a little bit differently. I thought, you know, maybe it makes sense to make a separate event of, let's just say, the Bay Bridges up in San Francisco. And then maybe a separate event for all of the Pier 39 stuff. This is a, a, a kind of a time lapse thing I've been working on, on Pier 39. And then I created a separate event for uh, the streets of San Francisco. So, for example, here's uh, Lombard Street and Union Square, and you could skim, I'm skimming through it, you can see the, you can just skim through your stuff really quickly. So that's just a way you might break, break a library down into smaller, you know, bite-sized pieces in terms of how your production unit's organized. Um, here I shot a short film uh, recently called Second Impressions, and here's just another way you might break it, break it down. This short film was broken down the events into acts, so like, Act one would be first date, uh, act two would be with frantic, and act three would be like meet the parents. So you could, you could set this up however you want. If you're doing an event, a wedding, you might break it up to like, uh, the events might be the ceremony, the uh, you know, getting ready, the, you know, uh, the reception, however you want to do it. There's no, again, hard and fast rule to this. It's just the library affords you the ability to make these really, again, really self-contained production units. You can set them up how you, how you want. Can I, can I make two comments on that? Please. Two more. So one, you might notice that in every one of his events, he has projects. And that's one way to organize, is to have the projects that are related to that media in that event be placed in that event. But it's not required. Uh, it's also not required that you only put the media in a particular event in the project in that event. So when you have a project, you can pull media from any event and any library. Final Cut Pro will track all of that to make sure libraries themselves stay, stay, stay self-contained and one library never depends on another library for anything. They'll always stay self-contained. So you can have an event, for example, that is just projects. So one way he could have organized the, the time-lapse ones is, is just have an event that has all the projects in it instead of the projects into those separate events. It's really up to you and how you want to work. That's how it's yeah, so flexible. So, so here, I just right-click and I just say, you know, I say new pro, I could create an event and uh, name that event, and I can call, I call this my projects, is what he's saying. And uh, notice it's asking me for what library do I want to actually store this in. And of course, it defaults to the one I'm creating it in. And I'll go ahead and click uh, OK. And I will get now a separate event called my projects. And if I wanted to, I could then take these projects here, and I can then drag them from here, and I could just drag them into there. So I can have all my projects coalesced or um, sequestered into its own separate event. Absolutely. And the only thing I want to mention, if you're not, who's not doing anything in Final Cut 10 at all yet? Okay. So I just, he showed a bunch of keyword collections in there and talked about metadata. One thing to get about the keywords and why they're so powerful, both keyword collections and smart collections, is that the same clip can reside in multiple keyword collections and multiple smart collections. So a clip isn't required just to be in one spot. It can be in as many spots as you have collections for, which is extremely powerful if you clip that is both a two shot and a night shot and an interview shot and a, a good take, and you want it to be in all those keyword collections. So the, the metadata tagging is incredibly powerful. For, and this is all, oops, all Final Cut Pro 10, not just 10.1. Yeah, exactly. In fact, you see here, uh, I broke the, uh, these aerial shots these, these, I have all these eight shots here. I broke them down into separate keyword collection. There's lakes, there's just the sunset shots, there's just like the urban shots. And very, very easy to do. Uh, all you do is bring up this keyword editor, this little uh, HUD, and you just, uh, you just assign them keywords and applies them, and it, creates, it automatically creates a collection for you. And, and you can also have a lot of those keywords be created when you import automatically, based on metadata that's in your clips. Excellent. So um, anything else about this? Um, uh, what I want to do now is, is pass, pass the baton over to Mark. He's going to talk about how Final Cut Pro 10 manages media, like where it puts it, um, how it thinks about it. Again, Final Cut Pro 10 is just essentially a big database. It's managing all this stuff. And it's 10.1 has just really made this whole process so much more manageable. 
easy for us to switch to the computer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we play musical chairs tonight. <laughs> so, you know, you can see here in Final Cut Pro, we've got, we've got media, but the question is, where does the media reside on your, on your drive or what drives? Where does it live and where can it live? And the answer is really, it can live pretty much wherever you want it to. So in order to do that example, what I'm going to do really quickly is close these. And by the way, you can take any libraries that you don't want seen and close them. And this is, this is where, um, has anybody used Philip Hodgett's Event Manager X? OK. So that product is essentially built into Final Cut 10.1, all right? Because the ability to open and close individual libraries is right here. So you just close anything that you're not interested in using anymore. Uh, or that you don't want a client to see, or whatever. And if you want to open it again, you can just go to the finder, find that library. So for instance, I closed, um, uh, let's see, second impressions, I didn't close, lifted, yeah. So I, just, I double click on that, bang, there it's back again. Yeah, you so, can select 10 of them, command zero, and open 10 libraries with one you know, keystroke. So it's, it's soup. that's one of the reasons the performance has increased so dramatically, because before 10.1, when you launched Final Cut Pro, it loaded everything that you happened to have open. And if you weren't using Event Manager 10, that was everything that it could see on all connected drives. That goes away completely. So Final Cut Pro, it just bang, opens immediately. And you can just open just what you want, and it's super efficient. So I'm going to create a new library. And I'm going to call it just demo. And what I'm going to do is import some media into it. And I should point out here that Final Cut, you could store libraries wherever you want on any drive. They don't have to be in a specific place. So the media I'm going to import, if I go down here, there's it's my camera archives. Yeah, yeah. OK. So this is a camera archive. Has anybody ever made a camera archive? OK. Well, you have to see this, this is, I really recommend when you are, if you're the shooter, you're being handed a camera, a card from a camera, that you don't just drag the media over to your drive, that you make a camera archive. What that means is with your camera connected or that card in a card reader connected, you go down here and this will be available, create archive. What that does is create a bit for bit, for bit copy of that card, but puts it in this container called a camera archive which you can open to show the package contents. You can put it on a Windows PC. You can give it to somebody to edit in another L NLE. It's just the camera card data. But the fact that it's in this container means that Final Cut Pro is going to handle it in a way that you can never damage the data in here, or accidentally delete it, or miss some data, or miss some metadata. So it's a, it's a very useful way of bringing your, your data in. So what I'm going to do is just open this guy up and select a clip. And I don't really care what it is for this Right now, I'm just going to select a clip and select a range I want to import. And then I'm going to click Import Selected. Now, this is what I want to talk about. This dialog box, let's see if I can zoom up first. There we go. There we go. OK, this dialog box is kind of the key to understanding how Final Cut Pro 10.1 manages media. There's a line here. Above the line is basically how you tell Final Cut Pro where to put that media within Final Cut Pro. Below this line, just this first part, media storage, is where the media lives on your system. OK, so that's kind of the difference between the two. So the first one, it says, add to existing event. And by default, it selected the event I just created. But I could choose any event within any open library to store that, that media that I'm importing. Or I could create a brand new event in any of my existing libraries. So I have full control over where it goes within Final Cut Pro. Now let's look below the line. We know where it's going to show up in Final Cut Pro, but where is it going to put that media on my, on my drive or my connected drives? By default, it says copy the files into the demo library. So it's going to take that file from the camera archive and copy it inside the library bundle. This is the recommended way to work if you're kind of a solo editor or if you're doing a smaller project, because that library will be completely self-contained. And giving it to somebody else, or archiving it, or moving it to another machine is simply a matter of dragging that library in the finder onto another drive. It's completely self-contained. It has no links to anything outside it. And it makes it very, very easy. The downside is that it can get very, very large, depending on what you're bringing in, right? So your other option in this pop-up menu is choose. And what Choose says is, I want to place this media anywhere outside the library. So let me back up a minute. When you copy into the library, that is called managed media. If you choose to put it somewhere else, it's called external media. And you can put that media 
wherever you want it, wherever you want, on any connected drive, um, in any location. It'll put it. It'll put everything you've selected into one folder. Now, but over time, you could of course import into many locations. It doesn't matter. You can choose what where to put it. Um, after you've imported, there's a very powerful command called consolidate that lets you clean up. Because if you're like me, you're importing media constantly during a project. And some of it's off a camera archive, some of it's some stock footage, some of it's some footage somebody gave you. And you can have media that's imported. Some's in the library, some's not in the library, some's across multiple drives. But it's very easy to clean that up and find, tell Final Cut, look, take all my media and put it all in the library. Or take all my media and put it in one location, like on one drive. It's very easy to do after the fact. The reason leave files in place is not selectable is because we're importing from a camera archive. And a camera archive is treated as if it were the card that you shot on. And you never, ever want to leave those files in place. Because if you eject the card, you're offline. So it's trying to protect you here. That's why that's not selectable. It wants to leave that camera archive as something that's never being linked to. If you were to leave files in place, then you'd be linking to it, and you could accidentally delete that file. So that's why that's not checked. On the other hand, if somebody hands you a drive full of media, or you have stock footage, or music, or whatever, any files that are already on your computer, you can choose to leave them right where they are. So you're not required to copy them into a library. So this is a really fast way, if you've got a, you know, a huge drive full of media, you can import them, and Final Cut Pro will just put aliases or sim links within the library pointing where, to where that media is. Which also makes the import process extremely fast, too. I mean, almost instantaneous, just boom, all your media is there, because it's just uh, essentially creating a little, little sim links, or symbolic links. And um, that's really, well, there was a question earlier about, you know, what, what library model should I use? Well, it all depends on, on what you're doing. So in, the, in this case, I'm just going to choose import uh, into the library. Now, from the standpoint of looking at Final Cut Pro, I can't tell where that media is, okay? I, I don't know. And, and, and honestly, it really doesn't matter, uh, but if you're curious, you can open the package. I'm not going to do it now. You can see our trainings. We dive into the package. But in, when I say the package, I mean the, if you go to the finder and you see the representation of these libraries, uh, you know there's no disclosure triangle. You can't open these things. But if you control or right click on any of them, you can show package contents and go into them. I'm not going to do that now. You should never need to for any reason. There, anything you want to do, you can do without going inside them. Uh, but in our tutorials, we go inside them so you can see what's going on and understand when sim links are being created versus original media. So the only thing I'll mention here is I mentioned that consolidate function. Under the file menu, if I've selected this event, I can choose to consolidate the event files. And this is the correlate to import. So the idea is you can always change your mind. All right, at, at any point, if you've decided, oh, I imported it all inside the library, but now it's way too big. My library's on my, root, my boot drive, it's gotten huge. One option is to drag that library somewhere else, but let's say, no, I want to take, I just want to move the media out. This consolidate says consolidate files into, and by default, it'll consolidate into the library, but you can choose, just like when we imported media. So I call that consolidating out because you can consolidate all your media, no matter where it is, in the library or somewhere else, anywhere you want, and put it all in one place. So between the import and the consolidate, it's a very powerful way to manage exactly where your media is located. So in fact, now if I say consolidate the demo library and say OK, it's going to say, hey, it's already where, it, you're good. You're good to go. This is a great command to use after you've moved an event to another library. And before you, it's another drive, and before you unplug that drive and leave, or, or you know, to go on a trip and you want to make sure you got everything, consolidate before you go to make sure you didn't actually have sim links. Because I don't know if I've had that experience in previous versions of 10.1, where you go off and you go to edit and like, oh, they were all sim links and my media is actually back at home. With that consolidate command, you, will, you won't run into that problem. It's just super powerful. And there's no more organized. It's more, there, were, there were several commands before, and it was confusing. There's consolidate, organize. Now it's simple. It's just consolidate. You consolidate a project, so it's just the media in that project. Or you consolidate an event, so it's everything in the entire event. Oh, so, so one more thing to mention about managed media. This may come up later. This is really important. Um, there's certain files that are generated by Final Cut Pro 10. Uh, render files, proxy files, and optimized media. So in other words, transcoded media and render files. 
All those files are considered managed media, so they always are contained within the library. Okay, so it's something to think about because in terms of where you want to put your library, because even though you might say, I'm putting all my media external, I'll put my library in my boot drive, that library can still get big if you're transcoding a lot of your media. So sometimes you want to put that library on a separate drive and maybe the media on a separate drive. There are, there are too many scenarios to discuss here of what's the best scenario, because it's, it's extremely flexible. We can do a little bit in the, in the Q&A. Yeah, a good segue. He was talking about the files that Final Cut Pro generates. There's a lot of times where you're going to want to generate what's called transcoded media. For example, if you shoot 4K, uh, you're not necessarily going to work at that stuff raw unless you have this configuration that Neil had. You're most likely going to want to transcode it into proxy media or, or optimized. And as Mark said, all of that is within Final Cut Pro's managed library. It's, that's, that's where it is. Um, I'm going to switch chairs again, musical chairs. And I don't know if you saw how yeah. easy that was. To, I just opened up three of his libraries for his projects. And honestly, we travel around a lot and, and move projects around. And it, it always scares me to death when we're going on the road. And with previous versions of Final Cut, I've got a project that might be pulling from many different events. And you know, oh, that event was offline or that event was on a separate drive. That whole problem goes away. I, I can't tell you what a big deal this is when you need to move m m media around. It just, it's gotten incredibly simple. So one of the thing, one of the workflow enhancements that's fantastic, and it, it really isn't new uh, with regard to workflow, but where fun, what the, where the Apple engineering team placed it is new, so it's much easier to access. Here's a short film that I shot in San Diego, down in Coronado Island, over 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 the summer, and this was all shot on a Red Epic camera, and it, this MacBook Pro is fully capable of playing back that 4K R3D raw file, and it, we've done it on a single stream like this. It's fine. But over time, you're playing lots of bits. Eventually, the, the computer is just kind of having to work hard at it and starts, you know, working, you know, starts dropping frames. Uh, so I prefer when working uh, with, with content, with material like this, is actually transcode the media into proxy media. Um, and it's very easy to do. You can essentially select the media. I've got to find the uh, project I'm working on. You essentially select the media that you want to transcode. And, uh, and let's see, it's like here. You can control click, and you, you can transcode the media by choosing a pop-up menu here, and you choose create optimized. Notice that create proxy media is not available. Guess why? I've already created it. That's right, it's already there. Because you can choose to do these operations on import. And a lot of stuff in Final Cut is like this. You can choose to do something on import, or you can do it after the fact. So I want to work in proxy because I'll get much better playback performance. So what I'm going to do is take my mouse to the upper right corner of the viewer, and you'll notice here, by default, there's a check that says optimized original. If there is a, a, uh, optimized media, Final Cut will always use optimized. If that's not there, it will default to the original media. Um, in, in this case, I want to choose proxy. So I'm just going to go ahead and select it. And what will happen is, well, seemingly nothing. Because under the hood, Final Cut unplugged from the optimized media and plugged into the folder with the proxy media, just like that. No relinking, no finding files. This essentially right here is proxy media. And when I'm working on I, I can, you know, I'm hard pressed to see the difference. I mean, when I'm working on a little small screen well, like this. No one just jumps out of a plane, they have parachutes. Oh. Okay. <laughs> so this is transcoded 4K epic material in, into, into proxy. Mm. 4K and 5K. 4K and 5K, 5K actually. <laughs> okay, how big of a shark are we talking about here? So. Really easy to switch between proxy and original media. I, I want to go, I'm done, I, I want to I conform, I'm done with my proxy edit. All I need to do now is go back to the little pop-up menu, go up here and say, all right, back to optimized original. And, and just to mention, you've been able to do this before 10.1, but the location has changed. You had to go into preferences before to do that, um, and now it's just uh, easier to pop it over there without opening preferences. This is a, is no, that's a, this is a 1080 timeline. It's a 1080 Actually, there timeline. Is a, there is a... Four. But you can, you can play it. Do you have one there? I think you've got a version of it. Uh, let's see. I thought I had maybe a... Interesting. No, actually, um, that's a good point. One way that you can quickly tell what it is and uh, is look at the very bottom of the project. You can see it always tells you at the bottom what it is. It looks like these are 10... 1080 timelines here. But it'll, it'll play the same way in a 4K timeline. Yeah, it's just usually we're, you know, if we're delivering 1080, we're, we're dropping 4K material into 1080 and then reframing if we need to. It gives you the flexibility doing that. Yeah. All right, so let's look at another feature that I find really handy. 
um, and it's called Snapshots. Now, this is a multi-camera, a multi-cam edit, and uh, let's see here. This is a multi-cam edit that I, that this is my daughter Kate and her friend Zion. We went on top of the mountain. We just, we did a three-camera shoot with two iPads and, and an iPhone. And, uh, <laughs> and it's, it's. We, we went from a red Epic to an iPad. Yeah. Was, you know, you, you guys are all laughing, uh, but this is, oh my, look, this is serious stuff to these kids. They can br shoot this stuff with their iPads, bring it into Final Cut, edit a full three-camera multi-cam shoot and post it to YouTube in 20 minutes. In, in 1920, 1080. In 1920 it's, by 1080. And it looks good. It, it does. It, so, you know, it's, you know, all right, I'll play a little bit of it. So, so this Bad is with a, everyone. We'll sing and dance to Mother Nature's songs. I don't want this feeling to go away. So, there's my daughter, Kate. <laughs> Now, this, this, this is why Project Snapshots are really, really great. Um, let's say I want to do, uh, do project versioning. I like this, but Kate's you know, a really hard client. She wants to try different things, but she wants to leave, <laughs> she wants to leave the original edit intact. Dad, please leave the original. I know that this is going to go in a bad direction, so why don't you just kind of just make a backup, please? So uh, if I control click on this, I notice there's two options, duplicate project and duplicate project as snapshot. There's two. Well, depending on what you're doing, um, most of the time you could just duplicate the project. Boom, do that, and look, I got a cut two now. And I can go ahead and make changes and it doesn't affect cut one. Perfect, except in this circumstance. If you have multi-cam projects, multi-cam projects are unique in that if I open this cut two, uh, multi-cam projects share something. They share what's called a multi-cam clip. That right there, that's the source file that has all the angles in it. If I make changes to one of these angles, just any of them, it doesn't matter. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, make this a little bit smaller here. So by the way, he just opened up the angle editor, which gives you access to the all full the length of every angle for doing things like uh, changing the timing or color correction or audio adjustments. So you don't have to do it on a clip-by-clip -clip basis in the edited project. There we go. I'm going to go ahead and select this angle. This is... Oh, this is the uh, what's called the active, the visible angle. So I have a some sort of a filter applied to this. Put on video monitoring. No, I want to work on this oh, angle. This is Travis's iPad, and I'm going to go into the inspector, select this angle, just so you can see this, and um, you could see whatever effects you already applied. So this, I have this bleach bypass already applied to this angle. See that? I just have a. What's really great is you can apply an effect to an angle in Final Cut Pro, and it'll. It'll take that effect and apply it to it, that angle in the actual multicam edit. For wherever that angle appears, that effect will appear automatically. So I'm going to go ahead and turn that off. And I'm going to show you. This is, I have to say that Final Cut Pro's multicam editor it has no equal, in, in my humble opinion. It's just it's really easy to work with, really fun. I'm going to open this up. I'm just going to take something like, uh, all right, I'm just going to, that's an ugly filter. But I'm just going to go ahead and drop that on there, right? So I've got that filter. And I'm going to step back out. And I want you to see this, wherever we cut to that angle, it's that, the angle with that filter applied on it. Whatever that angle comes up, there's that filter. Now here's where snapshots come in. Um, remember I said that, that with multicam clips, those, those attributes are, are shared because it's only one multicam clip being shared across both. So if I open this original one, what you're going to see something is, oh, that effect's applied there. You, you would normally, well, I would want that because I don't want to have to think about what if I've got, she's got me doing 10 edits and I want to make one change. I just want it to affect all of them. I don't want to have to worry that, you know, edit nine didn't have that effect change. You know what I'm saying? But sometimes you may not want that. And this is where snapshots come in. So you could say, you know what? Uh, what I'm going to do, instead of duplicating, I'm going to snapshot it. And I, it's like taking a freeze frame, a freeze of that project where it locks it into in that state. So I say snapshot. And you'll even get a, a date stamp, snapshot generator. So, like, so what the, the idea of the workflow is you snapshot it, go back to the cut you want to work on, make changes. I can go back in here at any point, and I can change the filter. I can, uh, let's say, add a 50s TV look or what have you. And the great thing about the snapshot is if I ever need to get back to the original version uh, that had that kind of aged film fit, uh, it's, there it is. It's been snapshotted. It's just huge for doing uh, anything that requires any multicam edit, or if you have a compound clip, which is kind of a container for multiple uh, video elements or whatnot. So 
so, so let me just recap. Most of the time, you just duplicate the project and be on your way, except in the instance when you have multicam clips and or compound clips. You can see you're essentially making a separate instance of that project. I'll add to that, because I actually use snapshots now by default uh, instead of duplicating, because when you make a snapshot, it just says, put this one away and let me keep working. You know, I don't duplicate, name the duplicate, and am I working on this one or the duplicate? I don't know. But snapshotting just says, take a picture, put it away, keep working. And it just keeps putting those pictures away, and I can go back to them. So they're, they're required if you don't want compound clips and multicam clips to change. But they're great anytime just to be able to make copies as you're working. So yeah, so I wanted to show you, because I think that's a huge, we'll, we'll just, uh, yeah, just hold on. We'll, we'll definitely leave questions at the end. Um, so we just got a couple more things to hear. Um, the other one is custom project sizes. And I'm going to go ahead and open this library called Grand Time Lapse. I'm a big time lapse shooter. I obviously like you know, my DSLR, and I love to shoot time lapse. Um, one of the things that's really nice now is that you can do custom project sizes uh, in Final Cut Pro 10. So you can make project sizes to the exact dimensions that you want. So for example, if I select any of these images, there's all my uh, images from my Canon DSLR. If I look at any one of them in the inspector, they're essentially 3456 by 2304. And what's not nice now is you can just select an event, or excuse me, a library, and you can create a new project. And here's where it's new. Uh, under custom, you just go down here and choose custom, and then you can put in a custom resolution for your clip. So, so those of you who love to shoot uh, vertical videos with your iPhone, you can uh, <laughs> knock yourself out and make a vertical whatever, okay, so for your project. Um, I'd love to talk more about this, but it's, I'm just showing you why it's, for time lapse, a time lapse shooter like my, myself, it gives me a lot of flexibility to work with the tire raster. I'm working with 4K images from my, my Canon DSLR, and I can do things because I'm working on essentially a 4K, and this time I do have a such a 4K uh, timeline you can see there. Um, it's, it's just fantastic. You can work on the uh, native, native size of the, of the images. All right. Let's see. Let's look at some of the retiming things. I've got a retiming. This is kind of fun. This is, this is all new stuff. It's like this, and it's like right here. Open this up. And uh, these, next to the library changes, this is some of the more significant changes in the app where some great ways to retime uh, your, your footage. So let's look at some of the ways that you would time, re, retime like, a, a clip like this where you have a helicopter and if I play this in real time, it just takes forever. Let me go ahead and uh, bring down it. You don't really necessarily need to hear that. And uh, I, you know, it kind of takes a while for the, uh, for the helicopter to do a com kind of a 180 revolution there. And this is a perfect candidate for doing a variable speed where the, where the you know, helicopter speeds up around the turn there. A Apple has made variable speed changes even easier. In previous versions, you had to get the range selection tool, drag out a range, and then change the speed within that range. Well, you don't need to do that anymore. It's much, much more intuitive. So you simply move your playhead where you want the, the, the uh, speed change to happen. And then in the retiming menu, you can go down here and choose blade speed. Um, the, re it's, the shortcut is shift B. But as soon as you do that, uh, what something will happen in the timeline, I'm going to zoom in a bit, you'll get a, this clip broken up into two speed segments. Here's the first segment. Here's the second segment. Now, I want another segment because I want it to go really fast to get to about here. So I'm going to move the playhead and hit Shift B. Now, if you look again, three speed segments. The beginning is 100%. So if I just played this clip now, it would still be 100%. There's not, we haven't done anything. But what I want to do is work on that segment. I want that to be really fast. Now, I could drag this bar. Yeah, that's kind of touchy-feely, loosey-goosey until I get... But now you can go into a custom menu. Hang on a second. You can go into a custom menu now, and you can choose an exact rate. You can put in a rate, which you could in previous versions. You can say, I want that little segment to be exactly 800%, or what, what have you. You can also choose to ripple or not ripple the timeline. So, of course, because you're changing the speed percentage, it's going to affect the, the actual clip duration. It's going to affect everything downstream. So you can, this is new. That was in Final Cut 7. Well, it's now in Final Cut 10.1. It was you know, it was sorely missed. Now it's, now it's back. So I'm, I'm not going to ripple the sequence. I'm just going to click 800. And, of course, since I didn't ripple, notice Final Cut was smart enough to add a gap clip there for me to keep my timing pretty, pretty slick. 
So I'm going to go ahead and zoom in on this so you can see what happens. You can see that that segment in the center is uh, 800%. And I'm just going to play it back so we can see what it looks like. Let's go play back here. It's an 800. It's really, yeah, it's nice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you can do this with your kids' soccer games now. Go for it. All right. Now, <laughs> so I'm going to, one of the things that's very nice is that you have a new smoothing option. You can ease in and ease out so it's not so abrupt coming out of the different segments. That's what these bars are for. You have these little uh, translucent bars. So, for example, if I want to ease out, I can, I can move this further away and it creates more easing if I move the bar away. If I move it closer to the segment, it's much more an abrupt change out of the speed segment. But it's very easy to just, it's just kind of just move these around until you get it the way you want it and then just play it back. It's, there's no Bezier curves, no math. You just play with it, play it back and is that, you know, it's kind of, does it look good? It is good. Let's move on. Okay, kind of thing. <laughs> right, so there's, a, again, very, very handy. And you can, keep, you can keep lading this. You can say, you know what? Um, I want another speed segment right here. You know, uh, shift B. And I want to select this. And I, I'm going to go ahead and go into, uh, I can actually, I can pick a, another speed segment here, uh, 2X. And you could just, just keep segmenting, doing what you want. You can go ahead and you can actually drag on the edges. You wanna, if you want to drag a speed segment edge, you can just grab this right or left. Um, I'm going to slow it down in that segment or speed it up faster. It's just the, the orange bars indicate slower than 100. Uh, a slow would be less than 100%. Fast would be above 100%, which blue. would be blue bars. So it's very, very easy to see kind of color coding um, what's going on there. Awesome. Right. So um, there's actually more to show, but I want to keep moving so we have time for questions. You've seen this project before, and um, the, this is awesome. So let me, let me just explain what's going on here. What a, be, be, let me back up. <laughs> it's very exciting to me. So, so Steve talked about multicam, and we talked about how, how powerful it is. But in 10.1, there's a couple of changes to how you can handle audio and multicam that allows you to do much more with multicam. Specifically, you can now detach audio from multicam clips, which you couldn't do before, um, which is awesome. You can also uh, crossfade individual audio components that you couldn't do before. And it doesn't sound like a big deal, but here's an example. This shoot that Steve did, this was this um, Red Epic shoot down in San Diego, was a single camera shoot. Uh, but what I did is a multicam edit out of it, all right? So, if I uh, shift command seven to bring up the angle editor, what I did was we had uh, three different sh uh, setups for this. We had a two shot, we had and two over the single shots, you know, over the shoulder singles, and I actually have two takes of the shot of the woman. I took all of that together and made a multicam clip out of it. Now they're not going to be in perfect sync, right? Because they're it wasn't all shot with multiple cameras. They shot over and over again, and the lines they delivered differently. It's not going to be perfect sync. But it is an outstanding way to uh, create a first pass edit on some kind of narrative piece shot with one camera because it's so fast to switch to the different, uh, either the different shots or the different takes of specific shots. Uh, so just for example, if I move to this shot here, I'm going to close that angle editor and just use keyboard shortcuts. But if I want to look at Another, on this particular shot of the guy, if I had option one, I get that angle. If I had option two, I get that angle. Option three, I get the other shot on her. Option four, I get this guy again, okay? So they're not gonna be in perfect sync, but I don't care, I'm roughing it in. I'm gonna pick the best take, the best angle for each you know, delivery of dialogue and rough it in. And because I can detach the audio, I can slip things and get them into sync afterwards. So for me, it's, a, it's a potentially a powerful way to do this. So I'm going to play just this little opening piece, and we'll see how this works here. What about, and what about swimming with sharks? Let me, let me make sure you can hear the beginning. What about, what about swimming with sharks? Hmm. Do I get a shark cage? <laughs> well, how big of a shark are we talking about here? Open water. OK. So what I want you to hear is when he delivers his line, there's a little noise right in the middle of That's it. Swimming with sharks. Hmm. Do I get a shark cage? It's like well, how big of a shark? Somebody was? sneezed in the background, right? Like right when he's delivering his line. So here's here is the cool thing. Um, I'm going to control click on this and choose to expand the audio components 
The audio components is every single individual channel that was shot for this angle, the ones that I've chosen to, to uh, include here. In this case, there was only one mic, but I can look at the audio from every single angle and choose different audio. I don't have to use this audio. So if I select this clip, command four to the inspector, and go to the audio tab, here's the channel configuration. And you see I'm only seeing one now. These are the four different angles and the audio for each. And each one of these only has one audio component. If the camera had two, like a boom mic and a lav mic, you'd see both. You can mix and match them any way you want. Turns one on and off that you don't want. So, for example, if I look down, down here, let me zoom in a little bit. Look down here, if I turn on this other one over here, the first, they're both on now, okay? I'm gonna turn this one off, and with my mouse over this, I'm skimming it, so I'm gonna play this different version. Do I get a shark cage? What, what, how big of a shark? Okay, it's not in sync, right? Because it's different audio, but I'm just listening for the, a good take for the audio. Let me try this one instead. Hmm. Do I get a shark cage? Okay, that's okay. Let me go to this one. I'm turning the one on before I turn the other one off. Otherwise, it will recollapse the audio. That's why I'm doing that there. Do I get a shark cage? What, how big of a... Okay, so let's say that's the one I want. There's no little sound in between it. There's a little bit of background noise, but we'll handle that separately. So what I'm going to do is check this out. If I play it now... Do I get a shark cage? What, how... All right, that's the audio one. It's a little loud. That's okay. I'm not worried about that right now, but it's out of sync. So check this out. This is the coolest thing. So control, detach audio, okay? Because what I want to do is slip. If I were to slip now, T will give me the slip tool. I'm slipping everything. That's not what I want to do. So undo, control click. Let me go back to the arrow tool. Choose to detach the audio. And now the audio shows up as expanded because these are all audio components. I'm actually going to collapse these audio components because you need to do that to slip them. You can't do it when they're expanded. And then here's his line right there. I can see. Do I get a shark cage? Okay, I can see his line. I can't stand how loud it is, so I'm just going to bring it down a little bit there. And I'm going to move the playhead to where he starts to speak, right there. Do. He's saying, do I get a shark cage? T. And then when I'm going to just drag this guy over there and line up that waveform with that frame. So if I play that back. No sharks. Hmm. Do I get a shark cage? What, how big of a shark are we talking about? OK. It's, 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 this thing is awesome. So, so just to finish this off, if we go into the next line. Do I get a shark cage? What, how big of a shark are we talking about here? He kind of delivers his line too fast. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to also expand the audio components. And then I'm going to trim back where he says that line what, here. How big of a shark are we talking about here? All right, I don't want that one. So I'm going to bring that back. Oops, i got to drag right here. And this is it, Steve. And I'm going to instead take his line from right here. So let's try this out. Do I get a shark cage? Well, how big of a shark are we talking about here? Open water. OK, now I get away with that because he's not facing the camera, right? So I can kind of use that advantage. So you can take audio in a multicam clip from anywhere. And this works. This is not a multicam shoot. But in a multicam shoot situation, you can grab some audio, especially if a person isn't facing the camera, and you can fix all kind of problems that you couldn't do before. The other thing you can do that you couldn't do before is, boy, when you zoom in, it's just there, is you can fade these individual audio components. Before, you could only fade the overall audio, but now you can fade the audio components. The last thing, I'm not going to do it here because I want to get to the Q&A, but you can now edit in from the, pro from the browser just audio or just video from a multicam edit, edit. So I can go through this multicam clip and find a piece of audio that I want and do a connect edit just to bring in a piece of audio into, into this timeline. So with the addition of the ability to detach the audio and crossfade the audio components, you can now do just about everything with multicam, including use it for shoots that weren't multicam shoots. Yeah, this whole connected clip is that at that level, no matter where I go. Now, you can, you can adjust. If I hit the R for the range tool, I can say, you know what? Oops, I hit there. With a range tool, I can drag on just a range and say, look, I just want to bring that part down. And one thing that's great about this, you know, it automatically sets keyframes to, to fade that range. So easy to do. Um, if I'm really adjusting audio, I'm probably doing it in the angle viewer, I'm sorry, in the angle editor, so I can adjust the audio of the entire track and not 
piece by piece like this. Steve Martin and Mark Spencer, everybody.